All right. So with that, I am going to introduce Adam Sychik, and we'll have our first panel right here. Adam, take it away. Thanks so much, Barbara. And, and what a wonderful way to start this morning to hear from uh, some of uh, the uh, university and college professionals about the challenges that you face. And uh, one of the things that um, strikes me, I've been in this field for a little over a decade, um, is that uh, those of us who've been doing this for a while, and we've got panelists here who've been doing this for multiple decades, um, have been on a very similar journey to the one that some of you are really starting almost today. Um, one of the networks uh, that uh, I'm a part of is the Investor Network on Climate Risk. There's been so much talk about climate change here today. No endowments, by the way, are, are members, as far as I know, or very few of the Investor Network on Climate Risk. Um, the convenings of the Investor Network started in 2003. There was uh, a pretty good take up by mostly public state and local pension plans. And um, right now, there are hundreds of billions of assets that are connected to the Investor Network on Climate Risk. The meetings are held at the United Nations. We get over 1,000 people to come to those meetings. Um, the impact of coming together and exploring is really incredibly powerful. So we've seen it within global public pension plans now for over a decade. The UN principles for responsible investing are now signed on by 15% of the world's investable assets. Again, mostly global public pension plans at the state and local level all the way from the Netherlands to California and New York and Florida and other places. So there's really a, a wonderful Investment. power of, of intention and of integration. And you know, my story in this field really goes back. I, I really start with my, uh, my parents. My father was an academic physician. Uh, my mother was a social worker and then eventually ran my dad's lab. So they were very intentional people. And I started out my career with intention. I was a university professor myself. I worked at a college, at Wellesley College, and as a labor economist. And uh, those, those practices of teaching, research, and consulting, I found to be very integrated with what mattered to me in my life. But really, it was hard to raise a family, as many of you know who work for colleges and universities. On, uh, although I had this very prestigious job at Wellesley, it didn't really pay very much. And I was raising a young family. So I decided I'd go into finance for a few years to try to build enough wealth that I could go back to a life of intention. I was hoping to do that for about three or four years. And that was in 1990. So um, uh, I haven't been able to go back and become a university professor again, although you heard from my colleague Natasha Lamb. She and I teach a course in sustainable investing at a green business school called uh, Bainbridge Graduate Institute. So I've gotten back into teaching a little bit, but I've stayed in finance now for 25 years. The first 13 years of that journey um, were actually quite painful, but very lucrative. And I was in the, uh, the mainstream finance industry. I worked for two of the top 10 investment organizations in the world. First, uh, Wellington Management here in Boston, and then Deutsche Asset Management in London. I was their chief strategist at Deutsche. I was flying all over the world. I was probably part of the one quarter of 1%, if not the 1%. But I found it, I think, because of my background and my values, deeply alienating. And I thought I'd get out of the investment industry completely in 2003 when I quit at Deutsche and came back to Boston. Um, when I started doing a search for what I would do next, I actually realized that there was a, a small band of pioneers <laughs> who had been working on integration and investing for a long time. I was very skeptical about this band. They seemed like a tribe that was a little bit sort of on the frontier of investing. I thought they'd be quite amateurish in the way they did their work. Um, I thought uh, what I knew about sustainable investing or responsible investing is you screen out Exxon Mobil. Why would Exxon care? You're so small. Um, so I actually approached the field with, a, with, a fair, with kind of a deep skepticism. Um, but then as I found, when I learned more, one of the things I learned about is something that Tim Smith, who's two down from me here, knows a tremendous amount about, which is the power of being an owner. One of the terms that we use in investing is passive investing. And so if you're invested in an index fund, you're passive. Have you ever known a professor on your campus that's passive about anything? You know, probably not. So, so um, what I realized was there was latent power 
that a small group of investors were using of their ownership uh, as owners approaching this and saying there's actually a lot of leverage in our ownership state. That's what got me interested in responsible investing was the stories I was hearing about engaging with corporations about their social and environmental footprint. And this work goes back 25 years, the first shareholder resolution on non-discrimination against gays and lesbians in the workplace was filed 25 years ago. And now virtually every Fortune 500 company, despite the fact the law doesn't require them to do it, has a non-discrimination policy against gays and lesbians in the workplace. That wasn't just because of the work of shareholders, but shareholders were part of that conversation. So I saw the latent power in, in being an asset owner, and that got me interested in the field. One of the things that, um, that my journey has taught me is that it's not about my own integration in this field. Everyone on this panel is a service provider, but it's really about empowering our clients to do what they want to do. And when you're talking about institutional investors, we heard such diversity last night from Jonathan Lash on the one hand, <coughs> who said, I want everything about Hampshire. I want to create a, a culture where everything about Hampshire is a reflection of our values. It's not just our endowment. Our endowment is a small piece of the puzzle. I want to realize our values within everything that we do. And then we heard from Bob Litterman, and at, at my company, at Argena Capital, I'm known as O oh, Nerdy One or Ono oh, No, because I like quantitative analysis and risk management. Well, if there was a shrine to O oh, Nerdy One, it would be Bob Litterman. He is, he is actually a world-class risk manager. And, and, and Bob came up here with a lot of passion, but you can see coming from mm. a very different direction. And I know he wasn't speaking for World Wildlife Fund, and they have, they have a lot of diversity. But he kept the conversation on the issue of value and risk, and risk in return. And you can see the diversity there, and that diversity is just fine. And we as service providers, and the reason why I have so much respect for our panel, that have been put together in a very intentional way. This is the most intentional conference I think I've ever uh, been at in terms of its design, um, is because they understand this diversity and that, in fact, that if, if you're looking to integrate these things into your assets, it's going to be different for every organization and we need different tools and practices. And you can come away here. One of the conversations that I was in this morning was, the chair on my board is made all of his money in fossil fuels. Every other constituency is with the program except for my chair. What do I do about that? Well, it turns out there's now a smorgasbord, because we've now have been at this for 25 years, of potential implementation approaches, from, from Bob Swap to fossil fuel free investing and everything in between. So really, let's, you can engage in this in a way that's going to work for your institution. That's very important. Last kind of framing uh, note I want to make is that you deal with such diverse constituency. I, I've been on the board of the Hyams Foundation here in, in uh, Boston for 10 years. And the Hyams Foundation is, I think, the most diverse board and staff in the city of Boston. It really represents where Boston is trying to go and is going as a city. Our mission is social justice for low-income communities in Boston. Everyone who's there has grown up, um, except for me it seems, in, in, in one of the poorer communities in Boston, whether they're on the board of the staff, and they're very engaged with empowering low-income communities in an era, as we know, with tremendous income distribution challenges. And, tr and, and the lens through which we do that work is racial justice. Now, everybody in that room is very interested in climate change because they read the headlines, but no one knows as much about climate change at the Hyams Foundation as probably 90% of the people in this room. But they're very interested in using their assets at the Hyams Foundation to affect change around things that they're deeply interested in, which is racial justice and social justice. So again, people will come to this with different lenses. There is many people that are engaged on uh, using their assets for empowering the bottom of the pyramid and dealing with the one billion people in the world that live on $2 a day or less as are all people that are thinking about this existential challenge of climate change. And one of the beauties of doing this work is you can actually integrate everything together. It's not the environment and social justice and finance, but all of these things can come together. And they're not at all competing with each other, but integrating. So we've got a panel here that really knows a lot about integration. 
and knows a lot about investing, and their bios are in the book. And the way we've organized this panel is to make it as much as possible a conversation, not just between us, but with you. And I know there are these high-tech ways of you getting questions to us and low-tech ways of getting questions to us. By the way, raising your hand is a very legitimate way of getting a question to us. So, so uh, just get questions to us as you go out. Um, um, one of the organizers said, I've got these cards that um, will say, you know, do you want each person to present for 10 minutes and I'll hold up cards? And I said, well, just stop me, but otherwise we, we won't have any formal presentations. So all of the panelists, although I've got questions for each one of them to kind of get them started, each question is something that all of the panelists can engage in and I'd really like all of you to engage with uh, as well. So let's get started with, uh, I've, I've identified four questions to get started. And the first three are about some tools and practices of what we'll call ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance uh, investing. And please don't get caught up in the nomenclature. I could call it impact investing, responsible investing, socially responsible investing, sustainable investing, mission-related investing. All of these terms are in that same ecosystem of what we're talking about. But for the purposes of this discussion, we've called it ESG investing, or environmental, social, and governance investing. And I'm going to start out with, um, uh, with my friend Tom here, who's right next to me, Tom Koo. Now, Tom's got an interesting background because um, he actually, uh, I believe, started his career at a place called Kinder, Leidenberg, and Dominey, or KLD. The co-founder of KLD, Peter Kinder, is right here at the, at the front table. Uh, Tom is a, uh, a longtime practitioner uh, at KLD. KLD was the first firm in the country going back how far, Peter? When did you start? In 1988, that said, we know there's a set of investors that are interested in the environmental and social performance of companies, and we're going to start providing research on that. Well, that research has become viral now. Virtually any company of any size now is voluntarily disclosing social, environmental, and governance metrics that can now be evaluated and compared to other companies. And the big data world that we're in is now facilitating the ability to actually evaluate not just the largest developed companies in the world, but in fact some of the developing uh, world companies as well. So, Peter and his, his organization really started that. What's happened as more investors have gotten interested in, in that, his firm has gotten bought by other larger and larger firms. Tom has stuck it out and is now really probably the person in the world, or certainly in this room, who knows the, much as the most about creating indices mm -hmm. that actually integrate environmental, social, and governance issues. His firm, MSCI, you may have heard of before, the MSCI EFA Index, which might be the way you benchmark developed country uh, stocks outside of the United States, is a well-known index. They've got a proliferation of indexes. So Tom's firm is a leader because they bought KLD and they bought others in doing the environmental, social, and governance research, but also in creating indices. So he knows a lot about the first question that I have for the panel, which is this. The elephant in the room, Tom. What if we screen out things? Isn't that going to harm returns? And it started with the South Africa divestment movement 25 years ago. Uh, many people screen out tobacco companies. You've now got uh, a movement on campus to screen out fossil fuels. That's 10% of the S&P 500. If we screen out all those companies, as well as some of the utilities, which would be another 2%, we're left with 88%. Sometimes those companies do really well isn't this going to harm our returns? So that's going to be question one, and we'll throw it to uh, Tom Koo right next to me here. Thanks, Adam. I uh, appreciate a simple question to get <laughs> things going here this morning. A uh, little bit about my background, uh, Hampshire uh, 75S, which means I entered in the spring of 75. Um, be well, for reasons only Hampshire can explain. They, you, they, they don't identify you by when you graduate. I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, also, um, I uh, like to joke that I'm a recovering academic. Um, I uh, was a teaching fellow at Harvard and um, uh, also taught at Simmons College prior to um, uh, finding my way to KLD. So I, 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 I appreciate, uh, I think, a lot about how uh, academic uh, institutions operate. Um, so uh, we, we have some slides somewhere, and so if we could go to... <laughs> Um, uh, w that slide, that would be Actually, a good, we're good. 
I think, is this where you wanted to start? Did you want, okay, let me, let, let's, let's, start, let's start right here. Um, uh, this, this is a, uh, uh, this is a sociological, my background is economics, but this is, these are sort of ideal types of, of um, investors engaged broadly in what we would call environmental, social, uh, and governance um, ESG investing. Um, and the idea here is to really distinguish fu the two fundamental motivations that people bring to the table um, uh, when engaged in this and where those different motivations lead them. Specifically, um, uh, on your right, you'll see what we've listed as SRI, which is an acronym for Socially Responsible uh, Investors. And socially responsible investors are fundamentally um, values-driven. Um, and the result of, of that being the case is that the, the decisions uh, they make that are about applying different kinds of screens, whether it's for alcohol, tobacco, or gambling, uh, religiously oriented, or even politically in the form of um, screens on Sudan and Iran, uh, for example, which a lot of state pension funds have, uh, the fundamental purpose is, is, by the under, uh, is from the underlying values and not because of a conviction about the financial benefits of doing so. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, what you'll see is the uh, financial motivation. And um, the extreme case there would be, uh, say, a hedge fund. Um, that, that buys our data, they have a quantitative strategy, all they're interested in doing is running it through their model to see if it can enhance um, their, uh, their performance. They have no conviction whatsoever about the underlying values of ESG investing, um, but the, and they're purely financially driven. Um, that's not uh, typically the case, but those are sort of uh, the two extremes, if you will. Somewhere in the middle, um, are, are uh, what I would call um, uh, uh, sort of sustainability uh, investors. These are uh, investors who um, are, are driven by beliefs about uh, the importance of sustainability for the long run viability of the economy and of the capital markets and of the, uh, and of the um, uh, globe itself. Um, they are, uh, by and large, uh, fiduci fiduciarily uh, uh, driven. Um, and what they're looking for is a portfolio that takes account of ESG factors um, and at the same time produces returns that match those of the market. And so uh, you can see the bottom line, uh, the slide's gone, I guess. Um, you can see the bottom line here is that, you know, the, the focus um, for SRI investors is meeting the alignment of their values with their portfolio. The focus of the uh, sustainability investors is really about matching market returns and getting the benefits of investing in a more sustainable portfolio. And the focus of the uh, uh, financially driven investors who want to integrate ESG into their um, uh, decision making is that they um, uh, are looking for ways in which it can help them invest more intelligently. Um, and so having said that, maybe we can uh, go to the next slide and, and, and talk um, uh, uh, briefly about the, uh, sorry, next slide after that, the uh, performance question. Um, and and um, uh, I think the, the simple answer to the performance question is that um, uh, I would like to, I would like it if, if at the very first step here, we could take off the table the objection that uh, you can't do this because it's going to harm your performance. Um, it's one of the, uh, I, I'd say, barriers that we've talked about for the last, you know, two decades that I've been engaged in this business. Um, uh, in the beginning, people said there's no data, and then when there was uh, data, they said, well, you, you know, you, future performance is no, uh, uh, past performance is no indication of future performance. Um, but let me um, say that this is not about what I believe, but if you look at uh, meta-studies done by uh, Mercer on behalf of CalPERS uh, several years ago and more recently at Deutsche Bank. Uh, just, just to interrupt here, so, so Mercer's being a very large consultant and CalPERS being um, the state uh, pension, the, the pension plan for state employees of California. Go Thanks. ahead, Tom. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, we, um, when, when I started working at MSCI, which is a four-letter acronym, 
um, uh, we got a um, dictionary of three-letter acronyms, and everybody um, talks in code. And um, so, stop me anytime, uh, anytime I start doing that. Uh, but those two meta studies look at the academic and practitioner literature on. Uh, performance associated with a range of ESG investments. And the results are uniform and, and the conclusions are really very straightforward. There's no reason to believe there will be systematic uh, underperformance uh, as a result of applying a range of ESG investment strategies uh, and in fact um, uh, taking into account uh, ESG factors may improve performance. It will vary uh, over uh, time uh, in different um, markets and uh, at different market cycles. Um, but this idea that you're systematically going to underperform uh, is simply not borne out by uh, any, of the, any of the data. Um, to take it one step further, I've uh, listed returns here on uh, two I indices we have. One of them was launched uh, by KLD in 1990, the MSCI KLD 400 social index. So it will For be those of you who um, go back with this work, you may remember the Domini index. And the Domini index was, I believe, the first index that was developed in the field. Um, and Tom can talk about its construction better than anyone. Um, this is the, uh, this is that index, and the, it's been rebranded and renamed, but this is, this is really, I believe, the original U.S. index that's attempt to say if you, if you start screening out things and then eventually maybe later screening in some things, um, how, how's it going to do? And there are a number of products that have been developed around the index, but the index has now been around for almost 25 years. Uh, yes, it'll, yeah, yes, exactly. It'll be uh, uh, 24 years at the end of this month, basically. Um, so uh, what, I, what I want to point out here, you'll see the sort of the red, um, uh, uh, the red uh, rectangle there, because I think that the only way to really think about performance in this context is the um, longest performance record that you can look at, because short-term performance is always going to fluctuate. And uh, I think one of the things that ESG investors are trying to do is get the uh, market out of short-term thinking about uh, uh, both how portfolios are constructed and, and how performance is done. Chris? Yeah, so uh, just to underscore that point, I, I've got a slide, if we could bring it up. Why don't we have t uh, Tom go through these numbers and okay. then we can, we can uh, pull up Chris's slide. Did you yeah. want to say anything about this? Yeah, numbers? I just want to say two things. What I've done here is, is put up two examples, one that's U.S. and one that's uh, global developed markets, uh, ex-U.S., uh, just to provide some perspective. They're slightly different types of indexes. The KLD 400 does apply a series of screens like alcohol, tobacco, gambling, nuclear power, um, uh, uh, weapons and firearms and so on. Um, and addition, in addition, takes into account the uh, uh, ESG ratings of these companies, so it invests in companies with, with the highest ratings. The second, um, uh, the second index uh, underneath the um, uh, MSCI World ESG Index, this is XUS, um, uh, takes a slightly different approach. It's designed to have financial characteristics very similar to those of the underlying market and therefore track very closely to it. And what you'll see in both cases is that over the long term, performance tracks quite closely. Uh, they have tended to um, outperform, but not in all cases. But this is just more evidence, uh, along with the piles of other evidence that exist out there in the marketplace that says these strategies are not a hindrance to performance. And so it's important when you hear that objection to say, we can show you evidence to the contrary, um, and you'd certainly want to see the evidence from anybody who claims that it's the case. Yeah, we have a question. Go ahead. Let, yeah, let me let me take that question, which is uh, the question is, what about fossil fuel uh, free investing? Because you could be talking about 12 percent or more of the index being taken out. And, and, and I think that the, uh, these two indices are, are really a good way to start in thinking about that question because in 1990, uh, the approach to screening was much less sophisticated than it's become. And by sophisticated, I mean integrating best practices in the, in the mainstream financial industry into, say, this kind of index construction. 
So the original index constructions were, well, if we screen everything out that we don't like, what's left and let's see how it performs. That's going to end up being a fairly volatile um, portfolio relative to your mainstream index, relative to being very intentional in the following way and saying, if these are the things I don't want to invest in, and these are the things I particularly do want to invest in, ask the explicit question using structural risk models, boy, that's a wonky term, but using a structural risk model to actually say, what is the way I can best track the mainstream index, whether it's the S&P 500 or the global index or the non-US index, having done that screening in and screening out. And there are a number of practitioners now that have worked through the math of that, and surprising to me even, they've been able to get the amount of expected volatility between the two things, between the unscreened and the screened, down to a very small number. So there's no question, and I've been engaged with this issue of fossil fuel free investing now for a decade as a practitioner, that in a rising oil price market, the 10% of the stocks that are laden with fossil fuels tend to outperform the index. That's a very difficult headwind for fossil fuel free investing. But in an environment as we've had over the last few years of oil prices stable to falling, you then have a tailwind because that percent of the index that you've carved out has generally underperforms. Yeah. And I could but anyway, higher, there's technology sorry, sorry. to minimize the, the impact of that. Yeah. I could, Tom? Just before we go on to Chris, I could just add one comment there, and it, we have a whole panel, of course, on fossil-free investing. But, but MSCI did do a study. Um, it, looked, it took the uh, um, a carbon tracker list. We did this on behalf of a large California pension fund. Uh, it took the carbon tracker list and it looked back 10 years uh, excluding that list. And what it showed is uh, essentially in line with what Adam just described, which is that during the five years when um, fossil fuel, when oil prices were rising and hitting a peak in about 2008, close to $150 a barrel, um, uh, the uh, fossil free um, uh, portfolio underperformed. In the um, ensuing five years, um, uh, it, it outperformed. Over the 10-year period, it underperformed about 16 basis points, which is 0.16% on average, um, with a tracking error of about 1%. So, Tracking so, error meaning uh, how much does the portfolio di uh, differ from the, the, the mainstream right. index? Right. And 1% means that two-thirds of the time, it was within 1%. Two-thirds of years, it was within 1% of the index. And one-third of years, it was different than 1% away from the index. So this debate will continue. Yes, exactly. So Chris, I... Well, maybe just to put a fine point on the debate, uh, I do have a performance slide if we could bring it up because... And first, let me introduce Chris because uh, two-thirds of the panel members by, by design and requirement had to be either veterans of KLD or, or, or right. work for a successor company. So Chris, Chris started his uh, career, as I know it, at, at KLD right. doing research and, and now has a 12-minute TED Talk in his position as head of ESG integration uh, and, and, and client work at a huge uh, firm called State Street Global Investors. And I'd encourage you, I looked last night at, at his TED Talk, and like every TED Talk, after the 12 minutes, you're like, I must do this, I must do this, and then, <laughs> and then 12 minutes later, that goes away. So it's, uh, it's um, uh, but it's, uh, it, was, it was a very inspiring talk, at least briefly. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, um, and, uh, but Chris, Chris is, is really at the coal face, or at least the clean coal face, of, uh, of working with uh, large institutional investors who are coming to him with a lot of the same questions uh, you do, and, and, and he's, he's, been, he's been at this for a while, so despite his fresh face look, relative at yeah, least to the rest right. of us on the panel. So uh, go ahead, Chris. Thanks very much for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, um, right, so I'll be very quick here. And what I wanted to do is just show a live example of an actual portfolio with client assets uh, in this portfolio. Indexes are fantastic. We're a huge index investor. Uh, I think as most of you know, including tracking, uh, providing portfolios that track a lot of MSCI indexes, 
This, however, is a portfolio. The key things here is that there's more than two billion assets, two billion dollars in this portfolio, and it has more than a 14-year track record. Now, our whole objective in this portfolio is not to outperform any index. It's simply to try and provide a return in risk characteristics that match the index, in this case, the S&P 500, as closely as practical. So we define risk as over or under performance of the benchmark. We're not making active decisions here. The key thing here, and why I'm showing this, uh, is not because it's a long track record and it's a fairly big portfolio, is because to this point about ex exclusion, uh, we remove from the S&P 500 as our investable universe 30 stocks that account for more than 10% of that index because those securities are not compatible with Catholic values. So this is a worked example of a screen portfolio. It happens to be screening for Catholic values. Now this results in those 30 stocks, more than 10% of the index. Most of those securities are in industrials, consumer staples, and healthcare. And you can see that over the long term, indeed, the performance is about bang on with the S&P 500. Over shorter time periods, yes, indeed, it does fluctuate. But the other key thing here, which is not shown, is that over the long term, we've been able to deliver on the objective of essentially equivalent return with equivalent risk and satisfying those Catholic values. I'm going to circle back to Chris in a little bit and ask him about moving from values to value because State Street has done a lot of work yeah. on can you integrate environmental, social, and governance factors as a way of enhancing returns, not simply being consistent with values. So, so we're going we're gonna to ask Chris to come back to that in a bit because I want to turn the conversation over to Tim Smith. Now, Tim, as you'll see from the uh, um, uh, bio that's in there, uh, was 24 years as the executive director of the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility. Now, the religious sector has been such a powerful force for positive change in terms of being intentional with their assets and being shareholder advocates. So, so Tim knows a tremendous amount about shareholder engagement um, from his work at the Interface Center, but then he went and worked at Waldham Asset Management. He's been there now for a number of years, and he's had practice now in working with clients on the issue of shareholder engagement and what some call shareholder advocacy. So I really want to, um, I'm so glad that, that Tim's on the panel with us and I'd really like him to introduce that topic of, you can stay in your index fund unless it's a commingled fund, and that's another thing that's been a real challenge that's come here. How do you actually be an owner of stock? And Tim's gonna talk about if you are an owner of stock, what are the implications of that? Unfortunately, many of you don't own a single stock. You own shares in a fund that itself owns stock. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one of those um, challenges that we're going to talk about subsequently in the day. But right now, let's assume you do own some stock. Tim, what can you do with it? Thanks very much, Adam. And I'll, I'll uh, frame my remarks in, in sort of the continuum that uh, Tom started with. So as you heard, I, I work with a, a group of faith investors for actually close to 30 years um, and who were probably being motivated by the values, uh, the faith values that uh, uh, are embedded in them. Uh, and the members of the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility have about $100 billion of assets under management. So they were um, motivated by values, but they were serious investors. I sit on the pension board of the United Methodist Church, which is about $18 billion in size. And uh, like uh, Chris and uh, Tom, we can testify that the screens that they've had over the years have not had a negative impact on, on portfolio performance and terribly important point to have started with. Um, I now work for an investment firm, so we manage uh, money for clients who obviously care both about uh, their portfolios and, and the, the worth and uh, long-term value of those portfolios, but they come to us because they're very concerned about environmental, social, and governance issues too. So some of those investors um, are actually the category Tom had of investors who, uh, if they're under ERISA rules or, or look-alike rules, they have to be uh, uh, very concerned about being a prudent fiduciary and taking care of those beneficiary dollars. And they do so, as we'll hear from the 
um, uh, the panel later on on fiduciary duty, uh, taking responsibility for their fiduciary duty, but also integrating ESG into that. One of the ways in which investors now for over f close to 45 years have tried to uh, use one voice to be a, a, a sustainable or responsible investor is let's call it share owner engagement or share owner advocacy. So in 1971, the Episcopal Church filed the very first shareholder resolution on a social issue. It was with General Motors. The issue was South Africa. I actually had the experience of attending that stockholders meeting and watching that drama unfold. Sorry, what was the issue, Tim? Uh, South Africa. South Apartheid Africa. Apartheid in South Africa. 1971. 1971. So that goes back uh, quite some time. So we have close to 45 years of experience of investors, at least institutional investors, individuals had been doing it earlier, knocking on company doors as a share owner. So now we've moved from screening to talk about how do we use our voice and vote our leverage and our, our power as investors to try to encourage positive um, corporate responsibility by companies or challenge companies to be more uh, responsible and sustainable. You can do that m multiple ways. So there's no one way to be an active share owner. Um, in universities and colleges, a few foundations in this room have been invited by um, the, uh, by Ceres, the Coalition for Environmentally Responsible Economies, to join in on open letters to companies or public statements about climate. You can do that as an investor expressing a concern, whether you're in a commingled fund or whether you own stock in a company directly. Of course, if you own stock in a company directly, you can write that company and express your opinion, ask a question, seek information, request a call uh, back to get, dig into an issue. Um, you can actually, and I'm, I'm assuming many of you do this if you have the opportunity through separate accounts, you can make sure your proxies are voted. So they're not blindly voted for management all the time, but they're thoughtfully voting, reflecting the guidelines that you have as a college or university. And of course, and the welcome mat is out, you could join in co-sponsoring shareholder resolutions. You could actually say, we would like to be named as a co-sponsor of this resolution whether it's to a fossil fuel company like ExxonMobil or a company on the positive end of the spectrum that you're asking to act in an even more uh, proactive way. The, welco the, the coattails are long. The investor community involved in advocacy, whether it's through Ceres or ICCR or investment firms like ourselves, welcome co-filers and uh, uh, work to make the job quite easy for people who wish to do so. So we have about 25 clients. I know Boston Common is here and other firms who uh, help their, their clients file resolutions in their name. It's part of what we do. And um, even if somebody wasn't a client, if they said we'd like to join in in this process, we'd be glad to help. So there's a, a, a handful of colleges and universities who've done this, Loyola, Bard, Swarthmore, Wesleyan, and so on over, over the years. But it is a very effective tool for uh, having your voice be heard. And I would suggest that when the academic community joins with religious investors or sustainable investment leaders or pension funds or foundations, it helps broaden the base of concern and has a, a greater impact. So Tim, impact. one thing that I find puzzling about it, or at least I used to, is, is um, it seems like this wet noodle that you're throwing at the dragon, you know, because, because uh, it's a, these are non-binding resolutions generally. The proxy voting is called proxy voting because you don't have to go to the shareholder meeting. You can actually vote by proxy, so you'll hear that term some. And so, you know, these shareholder resolutions are put forward around develop a policy around climate change or don't discriminate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of biased uh, against the shareholder proposal. It's biased with management. Management is generally not supporting That's these. Sure. If you're lucky, you get 20 or 25 percent of shareholders to vote. In the old days, it was more like five or ten. Um, you know, so you're saying, and, and they're non-binding resolutions. So, you know, why, I, why would a, why would a very corporation Very good question. I, I'm it? awfully glad your firm, of course, acts on the other side of that question to be a proactive uh, owner and using your power and not just throwing wet noodles. Um, yeah, but why does it work? In why fact, does, why it, in it fact, it does work. And why? not always. And of course, you're absolutely right. A company is, is quite free to ignore it. As a petitioner knocking on the door, thank you very much. I'm, um, I'll give you your three minutes and that's it. 
But the remarkable thing is as more and more investors vote their shares or support these proactive measures that you actually can create um, uh, momentum within the business community for change on various issues. So you mentioned commitments by companies to non-discrimination on uh, sexual orientation. Tremendous uh, surge in the last decade of companies that have signed up for that. Companies that are now disclosing their political spending records, um, a very hot topic. And let me hasten to say, because you're right, it's a petition, it's non-binding, but when you get 35 or 40 percent of the vote, very few companies are going to ignore that. So we were on a call yesterday with Emerson Electric, who had got a resolution uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it got 47 percent of the vote. They knew that it didn't matter if it got 51 or if it got 41. That was a very strong showing by investors who thought this issue impacted shareholder value. There was risk associated with it. They voted for it, and the company said, we need to act. You know, and and, and let me quickly add, yeah. uh, Adam, on governance issues, like asking for election of directors to be annual rather than on staggered boards, Lucien Bebchek down at Harvard helps pension funds file those resolutions. They are getting 70 and 80 percent votes. The financial so, crisis helped us here, didn't it? Because some rules were changed about mutual funds having to disclose how they vote, so shining a light on those boards. Um, and because we have these networks around certain issues, like the investor network on climate risk, you've now got big investors that are being very intentional about how they vote. And if you can come together as a community, I really urge you to do that. Don't feel like you have to do this on your own. Create a network that's actually going to work together and you won't feel like, geez, how would I file a shareholder proposal? Do I have to do that myself? It's just too hard to do it on your own. So find good partners, work in networks. I think that's, that's good. That's one of the lessons we really hope, Adam, would come out at the end of the day, that um, if I make this appeal and everybody has to go back and say, well, I've got to do this by myself in, in uh, isolation, it's a daunting task. Yeah. But when, indeed, it, is, it can be done in a kind of a common exercise, um, and I said the welcome mat is out through series and so on. Um, the uh, invitation to you to join in on uh, shareholder resolutions on climate change is on the table. And those resolutions aren't just to fossil fuel companies. We went to dozens of companies and asked them to dis disclose their greenhouse gas uh, uh, goals. Uh, Tim, for Tim sorry to interrupt there, but we only have a few minutes left. Yeah. And um, let's take a question from Jonathan. The, the question is, um, have we seen um, uh, institutions develop policy statements about how they're going to use their ownership now, rights? Now, I'm thinking particularly proxy voting policies. Yes, they're out there and glad to share some models. I think you might be asking for a slightly broader thing, the philosophy of, uh, of using your ownership rights. Um, yes, huge institutional investors like CalPERS and CalSTRS have written very thoughtful pieces, or TI CREF, which many of you are associated with. Um, just because they're big doesn't mean you can't plagiarize what they've said. The logic is there and it's, <laughs> it's quite useful. So yes, we can help point to that or the Methodist Pension He's Fund, which is even it though it comes from audience. a faith community, it's very transferable. Tim, logic. I'm very uh, troubled. Tom just raised the point. You're, you're advocate, advocating plagiarism to a ah. group of college <laughs> and university <laughs> people. <laughs> They have pretty good technology well, to avoid that in a hand basket, uh -huh. aren't they? Yeah. But uh, um, uh, th there's one other uh, sort of major theme that I wanted to make sure that we touch on and that we can follow on through the day, which is this idea of can you think of these environmental, social, and governance issues not at simply or really ignore them as value issues and think of them as a broader lens for enhancing risk-adjusted returns? So. You're looking at financial statements, you're looking at balance sheets, income statements, valuation. Can you also look at risk and opportunity around these emerging data sets that are now much more mature than they were 10 years ago and evaluate which companies are doing a good job of managing risk and opportunity in these areas, which aren't, and use that as a factor to actually enhance your returns adjusted for risk. And uh, we've asked Chris to sort of take the lead on, on how that evolution is going and, and, and what your experience is um, working with investors who are interested in that question. Yeah, great. And it's one of my favorite topics. 
Uh, so I'm glad that you've served it up to me that way. You know, I, I think what this really hits on is this, this shift or this pivot to uh, fiduciaries who, while they may be interested and concerned with sustainability, uh, really need to think about it through that fiduciary lens. And the, the spectrum of, of topics that really uh, could be classified as uh, s sustainability related is, is huge. The aperture of that lens is really widened, but as fiduciaries increasingly advance the agenda, they very necessarily have had to focus on the most material ESG issues, material in the economic sense of the world, mm -hmm. the word. So we've seen a lot of investors who are now looking to us and working with us on ESG really purely through from that fiduciary lens who don't identify or associate with the value lens. And what they're really looking for is, is there information in the performance of these firms on the environmental and social dimension that we need to be taking account of in our portfolio? And that's a very exciting development for us because we know that investors use ESG data in a lot of ways. You could use it for macroeconomic analysis or industry analysis or company analysis to get at management quality. You can use it for valuation to try and estimate cash flows or the cost of capital. But you can also use it for really screening and filtering stocks. And so we're very interested in exploring this because we see more clients asking about it. But we also think that there's a lot of validity to the really the, the investment premise of companies that perform well on sustainability all else equal can be, um, you know, very sound investments. In what, what's brain. your experience been, Chris, of trying to integrate? And this is a fairly new practice, uh, really, over the last, I'd say, yeah. ten years. Um, of now we have all this data. Can we actually mine yeah. this data in ways that enhances performance or reduces yeah. risk? So we'll, we'll get right to that. So we're when we are active investors, in other words, trying to outperform an index, we're quantitative investors. So for us, we need very rich data good integrity of the data, and preferably a very long time series of data. And now, because of the good work of KLD uh, and their successor firms, we have that. So we now can take a third party rating that is really a bottom up fundamental assessment of a company on their material E, S, and G performance that's distilled into a letter grade that we can translate into a number and put that number right into our quantitative investment models. Now, the motivation for us to, to look at that could be the expectation of client demand or the halo effect of being seen as a responsible investor. That's what would motivate us to look at it. But as a fiduciary, it's only going to get in the portfolio if it's going to improve the investment outcome. And we understand why it can improve the investment outcome if it does. And we have some belief that that uh, added value to the portfolio can endure going forward. This so we have, found, we, have, we have found evidence that indeed that can be the case. And when we have found that to be the case, we have taken the steps to integrate ESG ratings into the stock selection process of our quantitative equity investment models because they have improved the investment outcome. Um, I want, I'd like to read to you the preamble for, from the United States Principles for Responsible Investment. These principles were started in 2006 it's really astounding, $34 trillion of assets have signed on to this principle. $34 trillion, that's 15% of the world's investable assets. Not one endowment has signed on yet, but you have a chance to do it going forward. Because it's really been a project uh, mostly around, as I said, state and local and government pension plans around the world. No, 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 also hundreds of institutional money managers. I'm talking about asset owners. I, no, I'm talking about and J.P. Then the Morgan money managers Chase and Goldman Sachs and State Street. Right, they so are important players in that space. Right, and that's, that's actually the part of the story we want to tell because as asset owners, if you make a statement that this matters to you and you start communicating that down to your investment managers and your consultants, then they're starting to respond, often cases in a reactive way, sometimes in a proactive way. So I'd like to just... Uh, end with the, the preamble because it gets to this question of values. How do you create a big tent around this? It's mostly in a, been about how does this enhance return as opposed to how does this integrate with your values. Here's what the preamble says. As institutional investors, again, $34 trillion have signed on to this, we have a duty to act in the best long-term interests of our beneficiaries. In this fiduciary role, 
we believe that environmental, social, and corporate governance, or ESG issues, can, can affect the performance of investment portfolios. Can, not will, but can, might, could. That's kind of obvious. And it will vary across companies, sectors, regions, asset classes, and through time. This is, I think, the most important tagline. We recognize that applying these principles may better align investors with broader objectives of society. So actually, they're integrating values and value in the same statement, and it's having a powerful influence on change because they've come together as large pots of money, and, and the intermediaries are responding, as, as, uh, as Tim said. Probably have time for a question or two, a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, there and then there. Go ahead. So what are some of the investment uh, opportunities, things that haven't been priced in the market in this realm that, that maybe uh, if we invest in them, uh, we'll, we'll get an enhanced return? Yeah, just, just quickly, I would say you're correct where we have found the efficacy of the bringing the ESG rate in the investment process has primarily been in reduced volatility, um, which is somewhat of a, a, of a quality indicator um, and does add some defensiveness to the portfolio. But over, there have been instances, I want to be clear about this, where we have found ESG ratings to be predictive and to have some forecasting ability of the equity returns. Now, not in all cases, and there's lots of caveats around there. So it is still somewhat elusive uh, and, and less, I think, conventional wisdom that it does relate more to risk and volatility than it does to alpha, but it, but it can exist. So our view really is we think as more investors take this on board, there is increasingly rich data and all these other links in the investment chain get engaged that uh, with more take up, some of this will sort of create its own inertia where there may be more of a signal that associates with the company's earnings and their prospects which then gets valued by the market more than maybe these are just less risky companies. Thanks, yeah. Chris. And I, I'd like to end with a, a question or a comment from Dan. And maybe, Dan, if you could just talk about your role and, 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 and what brings you here before you, you ask the question. We'll, we'll do that later. So I'm Dan from the Responsible Endowments Coalition. I just wanted to ask a question. A lot of people here have limited time and energy in terms of what they can focus on. I think we're talking about there's a whole, so many different things you've touched on. So the question is, what are the key opportunities if you're going to focus on one or two things? What would those things be? And, and you know, is that different than what's been, what people have been doing for the last 10 years? We can, not just should we do engagement, but you know, if we want to focus on engagement, if you're anthropologist for lack of a better example here, what, if, what, what should that be? How would you be looking to do that? Do have to, not get to pick necessarily, but what are the top things? Because we've talked about Right. What are, in the future, what are like, the trends? What, you know, if you had to pick a couple, which one? Would you That's such a huge right. question. Yeah. I'm not going to try to take it's it. Go ahead. It's, it's a great question. You know, when I started uh, in this business 20 years ago, uh, I, th I came out of um, uh, an academic institution, as I indicated, and I thought it's a no brainer. Mission driven institutions, socially responsible investment, what could be more obvious? And it hasn't happened. 
right? We're having this conference here today because it hasn't happened, right? So the first thing I would say is um, join PRI, the Investor Network on Climate Risk. Get engaged in those networks that already exist. Learn from them. Second thing, a process thing. Remember who is paying whom for what. You're getting advice from your consultants and your asset managers. You're paying them. Part of their job is to do what okay. you want them to do. And I would, I would, <laughs> I, I would, I would strongly encourage you to um, take advantage of that because Amen. they're better equipped than ever, number one. And number two, the opportunities are there in terms of products as well as uh, these, these other kinds of uh, organizations. Including Tom doing research for the institution on an issue like climate change or sweatshops, including helping vote your proxies, including helping you file shareholder resolutions or join open letters. If the will is there and you instruct your investment manager or your corporate, your uh, your investment uh, uh, team. You certainly can participate.